Hello, good evening. How are you tonight? I am Dr. Karen Sullivan, neuropsychologist who is very happy to be with you most Wednesday nights at six o'clock Eastern time for another episode of I Care For Your Brain. And what we do here is we try to bring high quality scientific information to the brain health community so we can empower you by knowing what's happening to you, what to expect, where to go for help, what's gonna help you the most, what are the science-based interventions that you can bring to your everyday life for a better brain health, better quality of life for you. So we are gonna talk about something really interesting and important tonight, which is how our social health and a very specific aspect of our social health impacts our brain health. So there has been some recent research suggesting that having just one good listener in your life can improve your brain function. And I am excited to talk with you about that tonight. So we have to start off with one piece of information as a backdrop. This is very, very fascinating about Alzheimer's disease. And one of the things we know about Alzheimer's is that the structure of the brain, meaning what goes wrong with Alzheimer's, which is the amyloid plaques, the tau tangles, the pathological markers of Alzheimer's disease, don't have a one-to-one -one relationship between how that person does in everyday life. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is that there are about 25% of people that have Alzheimer's disease at the level of the brain but do not show memory problems in real life, do not show word finding difficulties, do not have the anxiety, the agitation that can come along with Alzheimer's disease. So this is like one in four people, if their brain was to be examined at autopsy, they would meet the clinical criteria for Alzheimer's at the level of the brain, but in real life, they had normal age-related memory. Holy smokes, isn't that an amazing insight? So there's been a lot of research into this mismatch. What is it that explains this discrepancy? Because if we knew, wouldn't we all want to do what that one in four was doing? So we call this area of research, this concept, cognitive reserve or cognitive resilience. And this has been something that's been out for about maybe 15 or 20 years. And what they really did is examine these people who had the Alzheimer's at the level of the brain, but were doing good in everyday life. And what they found is they had some common themes. They had been doing things throughout their life that we consider them to be making deposits into their brain bank, so to speak. So this helps the brain and the person compensate at both the cellular level to override the plaques and tangles, so to speak, and also problem solving strategies, compensation strategies in everyday life where they were able to go behind the memory problem and make up a new way of doing something, a new plan. So in essence, these are things that these people did with their habits, the types of jobs they had, the type of education they have that has reduced their vulnerability to neurological disease. That is absolutely amazing. So of course we want to know with as much understanding as possible, what are these activities? So what we know so far is that education matters, especially early high quality education. We also know that being physically active throughout life has a big impact on this cognitive reserve or cognitive resilience. We also know that our social activities mean a lot, our mental activities, how in depth and how repetitively we engage with high quality information. The most recent addition to that group is the social health and it still makes the most undervalued contribution to brain health. So what we know is within the world of social ability that so far two different variables have been pinpointed. This is not your, you know, forcing yourself to be an extrovert when you're really an introvert. It's really not about having a lot of friends. What it's really about is how you judge your social life. So if you decide and feel that you are lonely and that you are socially isolated, those two things alone increase your risk for future cognitive decline, specifically succumbing to that Alzheimer's disease pathology. So gosh, that's really important to understand in more detail. So there was a study that came out of Rush Memory and Aging project, this was just about two years ago, that looked at 89 older folks who did not have dementia. And what they found was they had a much greater quality, they reported better quality of social relationships than folks who did not feel that their social life was enriching and that they were connected. So this 
insight was so strong that even in people who had depression, people who had things like hypertension, chronic medical issues, the social variable was more powerful than those things. So in the last 20 years, we've gotten really into this topic. So if you just think about being lonely, being socially connected, being socially isolated, there could be a lot of different factors there. So a key question was, what is this specific variable? So the research I'm going to share with you tonight looked at five elements. The first one was contact, sufficient contact. Next one was emotional support. The next one was love and affection. The next one was advice, people giving you advice. And the final one was listening. So what they did is they asked a bunch of folks who were younger, older, all different age, they asked them one question in each of those areas and then asked them to rank themselves as having none of the time they feel that way all the way up to all the time. So there was a spectrum of none of the time, a little bit of the time, some of the time, most of the time, and all of the time. And so the question for listening was, can you count on anyone to listen to you when you need to talk? The next one for advice was, is there someone available to you to give good advice about a problem? The one for love and affection was, is there someone available to you that shows you love and affection? Emotional support was the next one, and this was, can you count on anyone to, prom to provide you with emotional support? And sufficient contact, they asked, do you have as much contact as you would like with someone you feel close to, someone whom you can trust and confide in? Then what they did is they grouped these people into two categories. They had the high responders who reported that either most of the time or all of the time they felt positive about those questions, or we had the low responders, none of the time or a little bit of the time. So what they did is they wanted to look at brain health, cognition, memory scores, and the social support variables all together. And what they found was really interesting. For folks who were younger than 65 years old, they had a different relationship to those people who were 65 and older. So for people 65 and younger, these are people who had not so great looking brains on the MRI where you would predict that they would be having some memory problems given the structure, the integrity of the brain. Well, it turns out when they reported they had just one good listener, their cognitive abilities superseded their brain scans. They did better than you would have predicted based on the health of their brain. And that's really what cognitive reserve is. So of all those questions, what it really boiled down to was when people said they had just one listener in their life. Isn't that amazing? Just one listener. And what I think is so important is that it wasn't that they had someone to give advice. Now think about how often you have needed to pour your heart out to someone and they start giving you advice. And like, you just have to say sometimes if you know them well enough, I'm not really looking to be told what to do. Like, I just need to get it off my chest. I just want to know that you're understanding where I'm coming from, that you validate that what I'm feeling is okay. So when we look at this body of research, it looks like for people who have really good social connectedness, don't feel lonely, feel like they have a good listener, this can reduce your chances of developing dementia by about 33%. So we have to talk about what does it mean to be a good listener, right? It turns out in this study, at least, people are not saying they need more affection. They don't need more emotional support. They don't even need more physical support. What they need was to be heard. So how can we be a better listener to people in our lives? And if you don't feel like you have a good listener, sometimes being that person, being that role model can help other people give you that same gift in return. So this is what we call active listening, the type of listening that science tells us is the best. And active listening is a set of skills that can be learned at any time. Sometimes people learn it in their family growing up. Sometimes people learn it from a very good friend. And sometimes people have to learn it on Facebook from somebody like me. So it's a pattern of listening in which you are engaged and attentive. You are present. You are not judging what they're saying. You're not judging what you are going to say. You're not waiting to say the thing that you wanna say, how that story relates to you. You have the intention in your heart and your mind to understand and to reflect. So today's lecture involves 10 different ways that you can start to incorporate into the way you interact with people you care about.
to be a better listener. And turns out now you're actually contributing to their brain health. So the first thing I want us to think about is the setting in which we have important conversations. The physical environment matters. You need a quiet place where you can focus on the person without interruption, without distraction, okay? And we want the themes of calm and quiet would be ideal. We want to invite the person to share with us. We don't wanna just meander around small talk and hope that they eventually get to the important stuff. We want to share with them that you have been noticing Maybe they're going through something and that you are concerned and you genuinely want to understand. So inviting someone to share with you is a really important first step, okay? It lets them know that you have an intention in your heart that you genuinely want this information. So you've got the right setting, you've invited them to talk. Number three is something you can do within yourself. This is setting an intention. In your mind, you can make the commitment to just simply listen. And what I like about this is it takes you away from this feeling a lot of us have that we are responsible to do something, that we should solve the problem, that we should come up with a fix for this person. But that's not what this research is saying. The research is saying, just simply listen. Your job is not to take away their pain. Your job is to meet them where they are at emotionally and be there in that moment. So being intentional that you're gonna give your full and undivided attention to the person, if you genuinely are curious and want to understand, then your behaviors will show. The person will see how you lean in. They will see the words you choose. They will see your behaviors. Number four is related to body language. Don't have your phone out where somebody can see it, right? Remember the power of eye contact giving affirmations with our voice, with our shaking of our head. We want to communicate that we're open and we are right there attending. They have our full, full, full attention. Number five is to be able to express empathy. A lot of people do this with a technique called mirroring, which is simply saying back to the person what you think they said, right? This is a common thing in couples counseling where there can be so much miscommunication. You know, what I hear you saying is this. If I heard what you're saying is such and such, then I would understand better, is that what you're saying, right? Just getting really, really into feeling how that person might feel. Number six are that clarifying questions are the only questions that are really allowed. You know, huh, you know, do you think you feel more this way or this way? Anything that could, the person can use to gain clarity into their emotions is really the only interaction that is helpful, right? Uh, asking about extraneous details because you're curious, right? You're a little nosy maybe. Uh, asking, <clears throat> you know, what would you do in this situation? It, 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 your job isn't to guide the conversation. Your job is to simply understand what exactly they are presenting to you. Number seven is to be okay with pauses. This is an important thing that we learn in psychology school that you don't have to fill up all the space when people are talking. A lot of times those pauses are there because someone's getting their thoughts together. You know, it, it's very important that we respect that emotions and language are two different worlds. And what we're trying to do when we talk is to map those two things onto each other. And it's not easy for even the most emotionally astute person. And especially if someone has trouble with finding their words, labeling their emotions, they might really need time, just time for things to settle down and to just be okay with the way they are and not rushing in to change the subject or to fill the space because it maybe makes us feel uncomfortable. And number eight is really at the heart of being a good listener. It is to validate. It is really recognizing that until you walk a mile in that person's moccasins, you really can't know, even if you have a similar life experience. So you can say things like, wow, I think I can understand how that might make you feel. Uh, I get the sense that you feel really upset about that. Again, leading with that curiosity that you're not quite sure, but if you're getting the the vibe right from the per person, this is this is what you imagine that they might be feeling. Uh, number nine kind of goes back to, you know, just hanging down in the pocket and, and being there as a witness to this person is to not interrupt because the, the whole point of being a good listener is that you're going to let them do their thing as long as it feels comfortable to you. 
um, and you are gonna be there to be present, right? You're not gonna be the one to try to guide the conversation. But number 10 is a really important one that we have to leave off on, which is you also do have to know your limits as a good listener. Boundaries are a part of being a good listener. So when you are in the habit of listening well, you will have a little piece of you that is also paying attention to your reaction. We, the goal is to not have it be a distracting large part of you, but you also have to know if you're feeling pressured to come up with an answer for the person, if they are triggering you in some kind of way. You basically kind of know your comfort zone around yourself. And if you start to feel like in an inappropriate way, that person is pushing up against it, or the person's distress becomes so severe, of course, if they start to talk about hurting themselves or hurting someone else, if they start to really feel hopeless, then this is probably not a job for you. This is a job for psychologists, therapists, counselor, clergy, people that are professionally trained to listen and really can provide more help that the person deserves. That being said, it is really important though, I think to work on our listening skills, not only for the immediate people in our life, but boy, wouldn't we all agree that if the world had better listeners, we might be in a better situation culturally and socially. Well, it turns out it also affects brain health and you know what we're facing with the future of dementia and how many people are going to live that experience, we really need to grasp onto any research that suggests how we might reduce those numbers. So I think being a good listener, not only is it being a good citizen of the world, it's being a good friend, it turns out it's also being a good brain health advocate and supporter. So who who would argue with the fact that we need more compassion, more understanding, more connection, more empathy? So what I hope is that you take these skills out into the world and give them to your people, your tribe, and I promise you that it will come back to you in some way as well because you'll be teaching people how to respond in a way that is truly most helpful. So what I would love is for you to share this lecture all across Facebook, wherever you can. We want people to have access to free brain health information that is rooted in science, not rooted in junk. So thank you guys so much. Please follow us on YouTube as well. We look forward to seeing you in the very near future. And thank you all so much for joining me. Take care, bye-bye.